Okay, hi guys, this is Dennis at um, Business Model Guru. Uh, today, uh, we're taking a dive back in history um, to, to look at some of the famous entrepreneurs from the past and their disruptive business models. We're starting off um, with a guy called Jakob Uga. Right, and that name rings bells. He's certainly not as famous as Steve Jobs or Sergey Prey, uh, Sergey Brin, or Elon Musk. Arguably, though, he was far more successful than any of them. At the height of his his power, which was when he when he died, his wealth was approximately two percent of European GDP. So if we put that into today's terms, he would probably have had a fortune of between 300 and 400 billion. Yeah, uh, that's, that's pretty huge. That's uh, pro almost uh, one third of, of, the, of the British GDP by, it, by itself in, uh, in 2015. So this guy, he, he, he didn't start off as a peasant. His grandfather was a, was a peasant. Um, basically working in the, in the fields. And his grandfather got into the cloth trade. His father then became a reasonably wealthy merchant and Jakob Fuga got off to a fairly good start in life, but he still was a common man. And basically any knight, king or baron um, could do him over if they particularly wanted to. So how did he get from this fairly lowly status uh, to the point of going to the uh, richest man or the most powerful man in the world, uh, the, the Holy Roman Emperor, and saying, pay up or you're screwed. And this was the, the extent of his power and his influence. And so I've put together a very rough business model canvas uh, to, to help get us um, a little bit of an, an understanding of what he did. So he started off um, looking at the Austrian silver mines. And going back in 1450, 1500, um, there was a, a big silver mine in Austria called the Schwartz Mines. And it was owned by a baron who basically loved having parties. His party trick was to have a dwarf jump out of a, of a big pie just before people were about to, to eat it. And he blew through his money. And basically, the first part of Fuga's business model uh, was to say, right, dude, uh, I know you're a high risk uh, borrower. I know that there's a, a massive chance of, of you defaulting on the money that I, I lend you. So, but I'm still going to do it. However, you've got to give me a certain amount of surety. Basically, I want control of the mines. So when you pay me back in silver, I, I just take it out, out of the mine myself. Secondly, I'm gonna give you the loans on a, a tranche basis so that you don't get all the money at once. So you're always gonna be expecting the, the next payment from me and therefore you're not going to, to welch on the deal. And thirdly, you're gonna give me control of your accounts so I can bring your barony onto better financial footing and that basically makes sure that you're not going to be getting ballooning debts which are going to tempt you to renege on me. And so this was pretty pretty cool from Fuga's point of view and it separated him out from all the other merchants at the time who basically had a lot more money, um, probably not that similar different risk appetite, but his approach was mitigating that risk very much. He was basically saw ways where he could control the future cash flow that was going to be paying him back. And he, he lent um, something like 3,000 florins and basically made a 50% profit on the transaction. He got about 4,500 florins back. And this, basically, this one transaction gave him the, the float, a large enough float to, to get started. Um, so, so that's the first part of it. Large loans on demand, uh, control of the, the assets to um, the, the, the Holy Roman Emperor and nobility. 
Right, and he, he repeated this a little bit, and this basically pretty soon started spinning off more cash than he, he could actually use. Yeah, uh, there wasn't enough appetite for loans um, and to, to basically multiple kings at the time would sort of take loans and then just say, no, we're not going to pay. I think Richard, several, several Richard, King Richards in England did it. Certainly some of the French kings did it. A lot of the Spanish kings did it. So money lending was a risky business, which partly explained that the high interest rates. So what he did with, with all this cash and the other point of view, the, the big trade opportunities, the, the marketing opportunities at the time was in cloth. But pretty much the, everyone was making cloth and it was a very competitive market. So the market I'm more familiar with was the, the English Flemish market of, of cloth and, and wool, wool from England going to Flanders and then finished goods coming back into England. But there was also another large cloth market down in, in southern Germany where we're talking about centered around Augsburg. And there was definitely a temptation to move into this, but Fuga saw that basically it was just going to be a large cash sink for very small returns because there's so much competition and he didn't have a particular advantage. So what he did at the time, uh, the, the, the Hungarian, uh, Hungary had been under the control of the, the Ottoman Turks and the, the Holy Roman Empire had just managed to, to push them back. So there was this big stretch of Hungary opening back up for potential commercial exploitation. And that part of Hungary also had the, the richest um, copper belt um, in, in Europe. And there was a lot of copper up in the north in Sweden. And copper was absolutely brilliant, um, not quite as valuable as silver, but one, it was easy to work due to its low melting point. Two, with the technology at the time, it was relatively easy to refine to, to a high level of purity. And three, it was needed for, for church bells. They were pretty religious at that time, building lots of, of churches and cathedrals everywhere. Um, the, the bells summoning the faithful to prayer. But far more interestingly, uh, you use copper to make cannon. And this was at the start of the transition from the, the, the Middle Ages, where everyone was running around with longbows and crossbows, to the, the start of the, the Renaissance and the, 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 the early modern age, where, where people wanted cannon to, to blow big holes, either when they, the cannons were, were mounted on ships or, or when they were used to, to knock down the, the walls of castles. And cannons each consumed half a ton, a ton, uh, depending on the cannon size, culverins, de demi culverins, pedarosos, lots of different types of cannons, and they consumed a lot of copper. So uh, what he did was that he used all, all this revenue, uh, the loan interest from his, his loans uh, controlling the Austrian silver mines, to, to then basically go out and build Buy, buy up a bunch of Hungarian copper mines uh, to almost get total control of the market. And then um, he built a, what they called a manufactory, which is where we get the word factory. Basically a, a large village where all the all copper ore came from the mines and it was smelted in one place, it was cast in one place, and then in the form of copper ingots, it was shipped out to the, the rest of Europe. And this effectively um, gave him, uh, and you can see here the, the mine development, the manufacturing construction, it gave him a very large market share. So he, had, he ended up with dominant control of the, of the copper and silver markets. And to then he was able to use this to drive out a lot of the, the other merchants out of, out of his markets and get monopoly positions, um, which was very, very powerful indeed. A lot of his, his work, um, he did uh, face to face, uh, negotiating with a succession of Holy Roman emperors, um, and then following up with voluminous correspondence, a vast amount of letters, loan offers, collection demands, threats, veiled or otherwise. 
and he basically distributed all the all the silver, all the goods, all the loans, a lot through the, the trade fairs, through his base at Augsburg in, in southern Germany, through the trade fairs at Frankfurt, but also in the major ports of Lisbon, Antwerp and Venice. And, and of course, there were the direct sales to, to particular merchants. So this, this is the basic business model. However, I haven't caught a few vital things in them. One of the key things that he did was he came back from Italy. Um, he'd been down in, in Venice, which was pretty much like the, the New York or the San Francisco of the day, because that sat on the, the spice roads going to, to the, the Far East. And, and Venice had a massive demand for silver to be paying for the import of, of spices, cinnamon, nutmeg, pepper, etc. Because nothing else from Europe was of any interest. That's why silver was so valuable and at its point almost as valuable as gold. So he was, um, he'd been sort of pushing uh, the partners with uh, the Venice and he, he was spent the time down there. And he came back with this idea of double entry bookkeeping. Now, all the merchants at the time had some mechanism to, to work out whether they were trading at a profit or, or loss. And a lot of them, um, the, for example, the Hofstetters had tried to corner markets before. Part of the reasons why the Hofstetters went bankrupt uh, was because their, their accounting wasn't good enough. They didn't have enough information to let them know that they, they weren't able to sort of corner the market and, um, and, and dominate it. And so they overpaid. There was more, too much uh, material in the market and they went bust. So what Fuga did was that he used double entry bookkeeping to, to help him control the the silver mines, how much profit would he be making on the loans, how much money he was spending developing the copper mines, how much risk he was taking on, how much money he was investing in the smelting plants, how much loan interest was coming in, what the rents on the mines and manufacturers, what the, the direct sales were for all this. So he, and then what he did, rather than looking it on a loan by loan basis and sort of going from one to the other to the other to the other which is what merchants of the day did he then consolidated all of his business accounts into one ledger so at any point in time he was able to say this is how much i'm worth these are my debts these are my assets these are my liabilities this is what my cash flow is like for sure it was not as Comprehensive, it was not as clear as modern financial statements, if you think those are clear, uh, they are in theory. Um, but he had a very, very good set of management accounts that enabled him to see what he could spend, where he could spend, and what needed to be done to keep everything alive. The, the other thing that was super powerful for him was that he invested massively in his own news service. Um, so if you think at uh, that time that it took um, two weeks, moving quite quickly, to get from uh, Vienna to, to Venice, uh, which is something that I've driven in, in certainly less than a day in the, in the past, um, it was very difficult to get information from one place to another. It was difficult to get it quickly and it was expensive. Um, so rather like the, the Rothschilds, uh, two or three centuries later, he invested uh, in significantly in a network of correspondence in London, Paris, Lisbon, Antwerp, Venice, Amsterdam, Frankfurt, um, all the uh, Rome, of course, all the other major places in um, in the sort of the European trade center. And basically, when anything happened, somebody got on a course and started pegging it to to where Jakob Fuga uh, was, and he was able to use this information to devastating effect. One example. Uh, was when he was working with the Holy Roman Emperor, I think it was Francis I, and Francis I um, 
basically wanted to, to go to war with France over, over Burgundy, uh, what we'd now call Eastern France, Belgium and, and Holland. And, and Fuga had very, very close ties to the, the Habsburg uh, rulers, the, the Holy, Holy Roman emperors. Uh, and he didn't think that he was going to, to work providing a loan um, to the Roman emperor because the Holy Roman emperor didn't have enough money to pay it back. However, the Holy Roman emperor had a, had a trump card up his hand. He said, the King of England has promised to give me 200,000 florins or however much it was to do it, right? So basically your loan is safe because the King of England is going to pay me and I will pay you back. Jakob Fugger went, hmm. And he stalled and he stalled and he stalled and he had this, um, his spies, the English Channel in Calais watching for the money coming over from England. And it didn't come. And then from Paris, he learned that the French king had bribed the English king not to send the money to the Austrian king. So knowing this, he was then able to say, I'm not going to invest in the loan to the Holy Roman Emperor. What I am going to do is I'm going to invest in getting a, a peace. And he managed to, to broker a peace based on this information, got the control of a few more mines, kept his the Habsburgs happy, kept the French happy. And everybody benefited, and Fuga most of all. And this was how he he used information in a way that nobody else um, did at the at the same at the same time. Um, right. What else haven't we covered? So we've covered the long term exclusive um, concessions. Right. One of the, one of the other things that he was very innovative and, and and this is absolutely priceless and indirectly uh, you could argue that it um, it caused the formation of the United States so at the time the the Pope down in in Rome uh, was struggling for for cash uh, it was a Renaissance uh, everybody the Medicis in Florence were doing these absolutely wonderful churches, Leonardo da Vinci was painting things, Michelangelo was painting things, and the Pope wanted to get in, in on the act. But broadly speaking, he hadn't got enough money. Uh, he tried a, a couple of um, things. He, he called um, a celebration. I can't remember the, the exact uh, Catholic term for it, uh, but basically a big uh, celebration where everybody went to Rome and paid lots of money and but that didn't raise enough. So Fuga went to the Pope and he said, right, okay, we can do this thing called indulgences. Basically, Pope, as you're God's vicar on earth, you can um, basically forgive people their sins. That's what the church does. And at the moment, you're doing it on a, on a very retail basis. Every church does this and, and forgives people. I said, I slept with somebody's wife. You're forgiven, my son, you're forgiven but it doesn't really benefit you in Rome. So he said, what we can do is each of the churches will sell an indulgence. So basically we'll put a price on murder, right? You've, you've committed murder, okay, pay me $100 and you'll be forgiven. If you committed adultery, pay me $50 and you'll be forgiven. And the Pope said, okay, so how's this money going to get back to me? Isn't it all going to go to the local priests and bishops as it, as it normally does? And Fugger said, no, what's going to happen is you're, is you're going to get me to collect it. And I'll charge you a 50% affiliate fee for, for doing the collection for you. And then basically, I'll make sure that all the popes and priests and bishops send their share back to you because I've got men in the area. I'm good at collecting debts. I'm good at collecting loans. And so the church raked in vast amounts of money because basically nobody wanted to go to heaven and they were worried if they turned up in uh, the gates of St. Peter, uh, the pearly gates, uh, and they got all these sins on the balance sheet, they were going to go to hell, paying $100 here, $500 there, $10,000 there. If you were super rich, was a nice, easy way to ensure that they got into heaven. The problem was certain people thought that this was a bit sacrilegious. It went against the whole idea of Christianity. Um, 
and they really didn't see that spending all this money on building the beautiful basilica of St. Peter's in Rome, investing all in all the Renaissance artists, was a great idea. And, and one of them was a, a chap called Martin Luther, and he said he banged down the, the door of uh, Worms Cathedral and said, this is evil, this is the work of the devil. And as a result, you got the, the Protestant Reformation starting to happen, and over the next 50, 60 years, you've got the real split between Catholics and Protestants. And as a result, you've got the, the Pilgrim Fathers heading over, over to America. And one of the proximate causes of this, definitely not an ultimate cause, but one of the proximate causes was Jakob Fuga sort of coming up and saying, hey, this is a great way, Mr. Pope, of making lots of money. And it brought to, to light the, the apparent corruption of the, the Catholic Church at the time. So that is our review of um, Jakob Fuga. He did lots of other pretty cool things, um, innovating business models. But I, I think what I'd like you to, to take away with, our modern markets are totally different to the, the ones that Jakob Fuga lived in. I and mean, we've got had five more centuries of commercial experimentation since then. But Jakob Fuga lived in a very conservative, very traditional environment. Commercial innovation was almost impossible for him. Everybody else believed so. You couldn't charge interest on loans. You couldn't do this. You couldn't do that. Everything was highly circumscribed. And through the use of a few ideas, the, the use of double entry bookkeeping, the, the use of effective risk management techniques to protect his loan interest, uh, the use of information networks to ensure that he was able to make good decisions, he was able to build up a fortune that nobody else has ever come close to doing on a personal basis. $400 billion net worth is what he, he'd have today. Probably far, far more in, in actual factors as everything's not entirely corresponding. But think, think, think about that. So when you're going out, think about all the different markets that you're, you're in and think, how can I change things very differently? How can I change the balance of power within markets and get a, a sustained com competitive advantage? So this is, this is Dennis Oakley. I'm from Business Model, Model Guru, and I've been talking about Jakob Fuga. Uh, whoops, I know it's... Looks like Fugger, but it's spelled like Fuga, rhymes with Cougar, and I hope I pronounced Cougar right. Um, and you can look him up on Wikipedia, and there's a great book about him called The Richest Man Who Ever Lived, and I don't have it right here. Um, you can find that on Amazon. So, thank you very much for listening. Speak to you soon.